We are on week four, going through John 3.16. Four weeks in one verse. There's a direct cause and effect there because you guys gave me five, six months of memorizing and meditating on one verse, and this is the result. So we're going to look at the fourth phrase of John 3.16, which is all about death and life, perishing and eternal life. And like everything else in John 3.16, it's about Jesus, and it's about us. So before we dive into this last verse of John 3.16, I want to put it in some context. Look at the big picture, and then narrow down to the small picture. And so let's look at John chapter 3, verses 11 through 21. John chapter 3, verses 11 through 21 will give us the big picture, and then we'll zoom in on John 3.16. John 3, 11-21 says this. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things, and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. Boom, boom, boom. Oh, now, now it's the memory verse, right? John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The text continues, though. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not, he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light, so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Wow, right? There is so much in this monologue by Jesus. And we're only on verse 16. Now, I normally help us out. I try to wrap the whole sermon into one sentence. Hopefully a shorter sentence rather than a longer sentence. A sermon in a sentence to hang all the details on. And since we've been in John 3.16, I have cheated every single time. And that is because I use verse 16 itself as the sermon in the sentence. So going back to John 3.16 as our sermon in the sentence. In week one, we looked at, for God so loved the world. God's love as the motivation and the context was huge. That he gave his only unique, begotten, one and only son. How he gave Jesus instead of loaned Jesus. That whoever believes in him, last week we talked about by faith, by faith, by faith. And then that brings us to the fourth Sunday. Whoever believes in him, that's Jesus, shall not perish, but have eternal life. So here we've got it. We've got perishing versus eternal life. We've got death versus life. And that's the context of this message this morning. We're going to talk about dead or alive. I'm sure there's going to be an awful lot of zombie references. I'll try to contain myself and not make too many walking dead. We'll see. We'll see how successful I am. 
when it comes to shall not perish and thinking about death. Which I say with my southern accent. I'm not talking about not being able to hear. I'm talking about dying. Death, death. I say them the same way. If you do a word study, if you do a Bible study on being dead and dying and death, it can be very confusing, my friends. It can be very confusing. Because the Bible talks about physical death and spiritual death in the exact same tone of voice using the exact same words. To die, have a funeral, be cremated or put in the ground is talked about in the exact same tone, way, and everything as being spiritually dead but still breathing. And so it's a complicated topic to study. Death. Physical death versus spiritual death. And because of our mortal coil, physical death is what really consumes us when what should consume us is spiritual death. Is spiritual death, right? Death. We are told in Scripture that you die and then you are judged. Death, then judgment. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 says, And insomuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. This is a reference to physical death. And we've experienced physical death in our lives. We go to funerals. And they're sad, depressing events. Even when there's a celebration of life, when we're celebrating somebody who is absent from the body and present with Jesus, it's still sad because we miss them. I have officiated so many funerals. You know, you've been to funerals close and far from your heart. And you know that funerals and death bring out dysfunction in a way that nothing else does. I, I learn a lot from funerals. I had a friend, his name's John, and, and he was dying. He knew he was dying. I spent a lot of time in his hospital room, praying with him, going over scripture. He loved Jesus. He had, all of his children were wayward, rebellious, horrible people. Can I say that? You know what I'm talking about? All of his children were horrible people. You wouldn't want them watching your dog. Much less watching your children. And John's salvation, he wasn't afraid of death, but he was worried about his children. John was a veteran of the Vietnam War. And he had a bronze star. And they, they hand out bronze stars, but he had a special bronze star, my friends. He had a bronze star with a V on it. There's a bronze star, and then there's a bronze star for valor. A bronze star for valor is one other medal removed from a Congressional Medal of Honor. And he faced death in faith with that same kind of bravery. Battlefield bravery in Nam. But he was worried about his children, so he hatched a plan. He said, all right, Pastor John, I want you in the room with me. We're going to pray for each one of my children. And each one of my children is going to come into this room... And their heart's going to be broken because I am dying. And I'm going to tell them exactly what I want them to do with their lives. I'm going to set them straight. And then we're going to pray together, the three of us, for their souls and their commitment to do their father's wisdom given to him on his deathbed. You ready, John? No, John, this is a bad idea, but okay, you want to do it, I'll do it. We brought in each child, and he laid down... Heartbroken daddy stuff for his children. You have completely ruined your life. 
You have rejected everything that mom and dad have taught you. You need to surrender yourself to a relationship to Jesus Christ, get back into the church, and start living right. Here's the first three things you can do. He was preaching it from his deathbed. All three children, individually, were broke down in tears. They were weeping in a way that you can't imagine crying. They were saying, yes, Dad, yes, Dad, yes, Dad. They prayed with choked voices. They left the room practically crawling on their bellies, rededicated to serving Jesus Christ and straightening out their life. And John felt like he had done his last good deed. He was appointed to die once, and after this comes judgment. And he had finally set his children straight. His funeral was packed. And not one child lived up to his father's advice. The Hail Mary at death didn't take. Which is what I tried to tell him. But it was a good effort. We see dysfunction and craziness at funerals and at death. Because we all live. And then we don't. So the Bible absolutely talks about physical death. The act of dying on your deathbed. Having a funeral. Being buried. And we handle it in different ways. Most of us handle it with a great deal of spiritual and emotional immaturity. All the dysfunction comes out. But those who have put their faith, their belief, their trust in Jesus Christ can see death, physical death, as a promotion. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. John wasn't afraid to die in Nam, And he wasn't afraid to die from cancer in the hospital. And that's the example to you and I. He was a man of faith who knew where he was going. And so he could be heroic and brave. Don't threaten me with promotion. Bring it on. Please make it happen before tax day. You know, get me out of something bad. Hebrews chapter 9 makes it true. There is a day in our future where we die. Sometime in the future, there is a gravestone. There is an urn that contains us. There's no escaping that. So let us prepare for death by committing ourselves to the eternal, timeless Jesus. And instead of living for this temporary garbage, let's live for eternity. For that, John was right. Life is short. And it is sweet. And mortality makes it so. Spiritual death. Let's leave physical death behind now that I've bummed you all out and you're thinking about your funeral. Let's talk about spiritual death. We have, we have a lot of experience with physical death, but now let's change the subject and talk spiritual death. Spiritual death in the Bible is about the absence of God. Spiritual death in the Bible is the same as the absence of God. God doesn't go anywhere. We reject Him. God loves everyone, wants everyone to be saved, wants everybody's name to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life and spend all eternity in heaven. But the majority of humanity rejects that. Spiritual death, the absence from God. Think about spiritual death, the absence from God for all eternity. You die, and then there is judgment. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, talks about the eternal destruction away from God. The torture for the rebellion of rejecting our Heavenly Father. 
Revelation chapter 2, uh, Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, talks about evildoers burning in fire for all eternity. And you're an evildoer if you do not have your sins, your wickedness, your evil, deleted, cleansed, expunged by the blood of Jesus Christ. We like to talk about heaven and the rewards and joy and paradise of heaven where there will be no mosquitoes and no tax men, I assume. There's no scripture verse that says that. That's an assumption of mine. But we don't like talking about the other, you know. Hell, Hades, damnation, the fire that does not quench. My friends, if heaven is real, so is hell. And the Bible warns us over and over and over again. Death, then judgment. Death, then judgment. The worst part about hell is not the party. It's better to rule in hell than serve in heaven. Have you heard that nonsense? They don't realize that the true pain and suffering in hell isn't the fire that quenches, that doesn't quench, the worm that's never satisfied, but the most horrific thing in hell is the isolation, the quarantine. We've all got the quarantine blues, right? You are quarantined and you are isolated from the Creator God. You are quarantined, you are isolated from your friends and family. There's no partying going on. There's no hanging out with your bros. You're suffering in pain, completely cut off from everyone and everything, including God. That's the reality of the pain and suffering and torture of hell. Hell is real. We don't like to talk about it. We don't like to think it. And we don't actually believe it. Come on, we don't. You don't really believe in hell. It's, it's this idea, oh hell. But it makes no impact it leaves no evidence in the way we live our lives. It does not. I know it does not because we are the children of God put on mission right here. And we are surrounded by 300 million souls right here, right now on the highway to hell. Damnation and torture, absence from God. And you and I have the tool to save them. You and I have the message that can change their eternal destination. And God has left us on the planet to be the voice and the hands and feet of Jesus so that people will hear the message of Jesus, be rescued from the path of hell, and go to heaven. And what do we do? We shut up. We sit together, the saints, and we talk about how evil and wicked the world is. And do nothing about it. We're too busy selling yard sale goods to share the gospel with the lost. If it doesn't involve Jesus and the gospel of Jesus Christ, do it somewhere else. 300 million people are going to hell on our watch. We have to accept responsibility for that. But we don't. And we won't. You'll sit in quiet, listening to the preacher, lay down some hell and damnation and fire and brimstone like a good Baptist. You'll go to your restaurant... You'll be served and surrounded by the lost, and you'll make no effort to share Jesus and the gospel of Jesus Christ in the restaurant full of dead and dying and damned people. 
I've been doing this a long time. I know that's the result. Shame on us. We're taking up the Annie Armstrong offering. 100% of those funds go to trained, on fire, full time, missionaries, evangelists, church planters, ministers, whose sole purpose is to be an instrument of God to reach the lost here, the 300 million we're talking about. And we don't care enough to give any money to it. We won't even write the check for somebody else to do it. That's the reality. Dead or alive. I got to think our evidence is showing that we're dead. We're not helping the kingdom of God. But none shall perish, but have eternal life, my friends. Spiritual death is the absence of God in damnation and hell for all eternity. Let's be a tool to help those escape such a fate as we have escaped such a fate because of Jesus. If spiritual death, the absence from God, isn't bad enough for all eternity... It's a state, it's a condition in life. The 300 million people around us are spiritually dead. They have the absence from God in their own lives. So that we are surrounded by 300 million walking dead. Insert zombie reference of your choice. But unlike the zombie movies, we're not supposed to be, you know, plucking them in the head. We're supposed to be sharing Jesus with them. The sinful condition is real. Funerals are a bummer. Babies are fantastic. There's something beautiful about a newborn baby after all the goo is cleaned off, it turns out they come out like purple and slimy. Not something you want to see. But once all the goo is cleaned off and they, you know, become a human color or something, you know, uh, there's no longer gooey and purple, then you get to hold them and their eyes are big and but closed. And it's like you're holding perfect innocence. It's a beautiful thing. I love being called to pray a blessing over a newborn infant. That's awesome, where I can pray for their entire life. I can pray for their spouse that hasn't been born yet. I can pray for children that they haven't conceived yet. What a beautiful moment for me. I love those. I love those. But that bundle of beauty and innocence... Is a lie. Because you know, within seconds, they scream their bloody heads off, and then you hand them off to mom or the nurse or something, right? Ah, here. We aren't, in fact, born innocent. Scripture is clear. We are, in fact, born diseased and cursed and broken. No wonder we're all dysfunctional because there's no such thing as something not dysfunctional we are born broken diseased and dysfunctional you see it as toddlers we even have a phrase for it right we call it the terrible twos a two-year-old in rebellion not just them but it was you and me too we did it, and we were good at it. We perfected it, and then we live our entire lives in that kind of rebellion. The lie that we buy into is that somehow we can be good enough to fix ourselves. Where we can be our own rescuer, our own savior. Even though the Bible tells us that our very best good deeds are as filthy rags. 
They're garbage. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All, everyone needs Jesus because everyone without Jesus has the absence of God and is spiritually dead. Spiritually dead. Spiritually dead. You see that in the first three chapters of Genesis, right? Chapter 1, God creates stuff with the spoken word. Chapter 2, you've got Adam and Eve. One rule. One rule. You can eat from all this entire orchard of plenty, but don't eat from that one tree. Just that one tree. And of course you know the story. The serpent, the enemy, has to go into this long, has to go into this long diatribe, trying to convince Eve to do wrong. And finally, he succeeds. He gets Eve to do wrong. How is Adam corrupted? Honey, take a bite of this. Yes, ma'am. You know, that tells you everything you need to know about the gender relationship right there. And after they had partaken of the one tree they weren't supposed to, after they have rebelled against God, they hid from God because they were ashamed. And God kicks them out of paradise. And every generation born after Adam and Eve, every generation is born with that scar, that disease, that curse, that brokenness, that sin. The theologians, the Bible scholars, the, you know, those people, they've got a term for it. Original sin. Another term that's used is ancestral, ancestral sin, where we are born with the sin of Adam in our infancy. It's true. It's why we need Jesus. So we are born spiritually dead. We are born absent from God. And we need an infusion of Jesus and the gospel of Jesus Christ in order to save us, in order to rescue us. We are the living surrounded by the dead. Let's behave like it. And be the EMTs God wants us to be. Dead or alive, my friends. Dead or alive. Are you spiritually dead now even the living dead come to church where is the evidence that you're alive in Jesus prove it That's the conversation we should be having among the generations in our household. We should be demonstrating that we're alive in Jesus. What does Romans 8 verse 23 say? For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit... You are putting to death the deeds of the body. You will live. Dead or alive? Are you dead or alive? Prove it with some evidence in your life. Let's talk about these things. All right, shall not perish. Dead. Let's go back to John 3.16 before I get in left field. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Death and life. Let's talk about life. Start with bad news, and with good news, see? And with good news. Let's talk about life. Life is so precious. Life is so beautiful. It's a glorious thing. 
to be alive and to be part of the living experience. It's so gorgeous. I walked out my front door walking my wife's dog and I heard children at play. We've got a school right across the street and it was recess time. And these children were loud and joyful and they were having a blast and it just filled my heart full of joy in a way that only children can do, right? It's beautiful to see children playing outside and having fun on the playground. And then I noticed that the children's noise off in the distance was contrasted by bird song. The birds were singing around me. Why? Because it was spring, finally. And so I'm there with the dog on the leash. I'm listening to this, this, this joyful sound of children and then bird song. And I had one of those moments. One of those moments when... I'm living in the actual present moment. Have you had one of those? Where instead of you're just numb and quickly going to one thing or another, you, all of a sudden you go, this is it. This is beautiful. This is glorious. I, I feel alive right here and now. I feel the presence of the creator right here and right now. I soaked it in, you guys. And it was like, it was like pure energy from heaven. And then I had to pick up poop from the dog. <laughs> you know, it's good. It's good to have a, a divine moment and then humility. You know, it, it balances all things out. Life is precious. Life is beautiful. Scripture tells us that you and I are fearfully and wonderfully made. Scripture tells us that God knew who we are are and who we would be before he knit us in the womb. Think about that. Before the cells started to divide, God had you figured out. None of us are an accident. We are made in the image of God and we need to celebrate that. We need to look for the image of God in people. And then be inspired by that. Life is absolutely a gift. And we shouldn't waste it with nonsense. We shouldn't waste it toiling for the garbage. We should use the precious time we have to make the most good, the greatest impact. Time is the only resource that is absolutely limited, you can't buy more, you can't get more. You can't ration it out. All you can do is spend it correctly. That'll keep you up at night. <laughs> Scripture also tells us that our end mark is set before we are born. Before the cells divide in mama, God has already decided your last day. Before I was born, God knew what day I would die. I'm glad I don't know. I'm too shallow. I would probably uh, you know, use that knowledge wrongly. <laughs> We're not guaranteed anything. We're not guaranteed today. Somebody may die today. And this is our last moment. You're not guaranteed next year. We're given a specific amount of time. Let's use it right. That's why in the Gospel of Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus makes the reference to not worry about tomorrow. For each day has enough trouble of its own. And yet we're really bad at that. Life is a gift. It's precious and it's beautiful. Let's spend our lives working toward the precious. Let's spend it on what really matters, my friend. That's what I pray when I pray over a newborn infant. I don't pray for them to have a long and healthy and happy life. That's a silly prayer. That's a wasteful prayer. 
I pray for the Holy Spirit to convict them of their sins and call them into the kingdom of God. That this child would put their faith, their belief, their trust in Jesus Christ. That they would surrender themselves to Jesus Christ early in life so they would not have the scars of rebellion. So they would not go through the trauma and the tragedy of living selfless, selfishly in rebellion to God. I pray that God would call this infant into service in his kingdom so that they would be evangelists or pastors, preachers, or missionaries. That they would be fully used by God to impact humanity for the kingdom of God. I was asked that about millennials. I'm an old man, and old men and women complain about millennials because we don't understand millennials. So if you're a millennial, please be patient with me. I don't understand you. And probably never will. The millennial generation just confuses us and frustrates the older generation. And so I got asked by somebody even older than I am, what do I think of millennials? I think it was a bait to argue and complain about millennials. <laughs> and here's what I absolutely believe. I think millennials have a sense of destiny. They think they were born with a purpose, and they want to leave the planet in better shape than they found it. I think that qualifies that entire generation of millennials. I think that's true. I, I don't think it's original. I think I read that and totally stole it. They have a sense of divine purpose, and they want to leave the planet better than they found it. That's why all that environmental stuff, all the social stuff, all the culture stuff is going the way it is going because the millennials want to leave the place in better condition than they found it. Something we have not done. We've left the world in a worse condition than we found it. They're trying to fix our mistakes. And I think that's true. But I know something to add to that. Can you imagine what God could do with a generation of people who, without God, feels a sense of divine purpose, they were born for a reason, and they want to leave the place better than they found it? Can you imagine what God can do with that? Can you imagine if he raises up the entire generation of millennials to serve the kingdom of God so that they have a sense of divine destiny that us old people have never bought into? And they want to leave the planet in a better condition than they found it, so they want to reach the 300 million around them that are going to hell so that souls will be saved. I can see how the millennial generation could be an instrument of our all-powerful Heavenly Father God to reach all humanity. They may be the greatest missionary evangelistic force in the history of humanity. Bring it on, God! What God needs is for us old people to get out of the way and shut up. Because when the millennials come to church, we want them to conform to our mistakes instead of bracing their potential. Life is precious and short. And I can see the potential of God working in the millennial generation to use their precious days to fix my mistakes and to change the world for the better. Church historians call those things great awakenings. And depending on how you count great awakenings, there's either been three or twelve. I don't have that many fingers. I've got to keep it down to a single digit. I think there's a great awakening possibility here. It's totally doable. Praise the Lord for what he is doing. Life is a precious gift. Life without God can be seen in the way people live their lives in absolute selfishness. 
So people live their entire lives focused in on me, 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 iniquity, sin, evil. They're living in death, and they are spreading that kind of death culture around them. That's who we have around us. You can be physically alive and spiritually dead. That's actually the normal condition of humanity. To be spiritually alive is the unique oddball. We're the minority in humanity. We can only be alive in God because of Jesus Christ. Because of putting our faith, our belief, our trust in him. It's an act of God that saves us. Life without God is the reality of the people around us. Jesus is the embodiment, the personification, the being of life. It's all wrapped up in him, my friend. Life in Jesus when we put our faith, our belief, our trust in Jesus Christ, and we come to him scarred, broken, diseased, and dysfunctional, Jesus saves our souls, writing our names in the Lamb's book of life, and changing our eternal destination from hell to heaven. But he also does so much more. He heals us from our sin, our evil, and our wickedness. If you will confess with your mouth your sin, God is faithful and will forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that instead of a sinner doing what a sinner does, and that is sinning, God shatters that entire image. And now you are a forgiven sinner. And the chains of bondage to sin and Satan are completely shattered because he has healed us from the addiction of, and the status of sin, evil, and wickedness. Therefore, we can have victory in Jesus. And the Bible talks an awful lot about both of those. In Jesus Christ, when you put your faith, your belief, your trust in Jesus Christ, we have life in victory against sin, but we also have life being restored and healed. God steps into our lives, and he blesses us by putting us back together. He makes us whole again. When I came to faith in Jesus Christ, I knew I was a sinner. I was a senior in high school. I had totally screwed up my entire life. I knew I had done it. I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. I put my faith in him. I asked for the forgiveness of my sins. I surrendered myself to him being bought, master and Lord. And when I did that, it was like there was a huge weight lifted off my shoulders. It was like I was carrying a 400-pound beam on my shoulders like this, and it was weighing me down, and that was my continual life condition. But when I put my faith, my belief, my trust in Jesus Christ, he restored me by removing that beam, and I felt free, light, ready to dance and shout for joy. I wanted to throw a party, not knowing that Baptists aren't really good at that. You probably have the same experience when you came to faith in Jesus Christ and you felt restored. The lights were brighter. You were on fire for what Jesus was going to be doing. You read your Bible. You memorized scripture. Every time the door was open, you went to church. And then it slowly faded like the beginnings of a beautiful romance the flames cool life in Jesus is about being healed from sin life in Jesus is about being restored and life in Jesus is about being empowered by the Holy Spirit see that's the thing we don't have to do it in our own strength we don't have to do it in our own strength it's really, it's really not up to us. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. The Holy Spirit will come upon us and we will be Jesus' witnesses to the whole world. If we will simply submit to the power of the Holy Spirit, 
then we will have the boldness and the courage to share Jesus Christ with the lost around us. Because we are empowered by Him. And we need that empowerment. We don't need a class on 12 ways to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the waitress. You just need to look into their eyes, smile, and offer to pray with them. Listen to the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit is directing you to do. Let's get busy with it. On mission. Fulfilling our divine purpose. So that we don't waste our life in Jesus. Now. Healed, restored, and empowered. Dead or alive, my friends. Jesus is the life. John chapter 14, verse 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus is the only source of way, truth, and life. And if you'll come to Jesus Christ, you will experience these blessings. It's exclusive. It's an exclusive offer that only Jesus can offer. Because no one can access life, truth, or the way except through Jesus Christ. That's what John 14 verse 6 says. It's what he means. Come to Jesus and receive forgiveness, restoration, healing, and empowerment. Don't keep it to yourself. Share Jesus with the 300 million dying around you. Because he is the embodiment of way, truth, and life. We've got the cure in our hands for the disease of the people around us. How selfish is that to keep it to ourselves? We are supposed to be living spiritual life as we go. That's why he's kept us alive. Or else when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, why doesn't he just kill you then? Instead, he puts us on mission. He puts us on mission. Think of Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20 is absolutely a verse we should be living in the middle of. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, that's every moment of every day. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Doesn't Galatians 2.20 sound like John 3.16? With just a little extra commentary in there. We're supposed to die to ourselves in Jesus Christ and then live the rest of our lives for Jesus Christ. It's not that complicated. It's not that hard. We just got to do it. Or how about Romans chapter 12? I love Romans chapter 12. Galatians 2.20 is a scripture memory verse for me. Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 is a scripture memory verse. And again, it's in that same lines of Galatians 2.20 and John 3.16. Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 gives us the mission. What we're supposed to be doing. Every moment of every day in every relationship. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says this, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. Selfless, sacrificial, dying. Acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Our lifestyle all week long is a spiritual service of worship. We do it in sacrifice. And do not be conformed to this world. Don't be like the dead, because you're alive in Jesus. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. We can do this, my friend. If you're alive in Jesus Christ, I beg you, please, please, for yourself, for the kingdom of God, for Jesus, for Leighton Hills Baptist Church, for the 300 million, please live like you're alive in Jesus. And if you're dead, then come to Jesus for life. Pray for Jesus to save you from your sins and to become your boss 
your master, your Lord, and let him step in and forgive you, heal you, restore you, and empower you, and then start living your sacrificial life, not conformed to this world, but transformed. Do it. Don't be dead anymore. Are you dead or alive? Dead or alive? John 17, verse 3 says it clearly. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Life eternal. Isn't about the longevity, but is it about our relationship with God? Praise the Lord. Are you dead or alive? Hear the call of the Holy Spirit. Let's talk about death and life in the generations around our table, sitting on our sofa. Let's make sure that we know what we're talking about. Will you pray with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we come before your throne and we thank you and praise you for Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I pray, Father, you would convict us of our heart, whether we are dead or alive. Open our ears, open our eyes, make us hear you as you tell us whether we are dead or alive. Hear our hearts as we respond to